Nathan, unbelievable story. So thank you so much for sharing that. Hopefully we can kind of follow up and, and summarize. And also, Christopher uh, Palmer Ennings here. Christopher, stand up with Active Ventures. Thank you for inviting me to speak and the stuff. I've got my EO Forum member here, Alberto, so it's good to be. So we've got a company called Gazelles. I want to get us back on time here quickly. And so let me kind of move forward. As Shankar had mentioned, and it's not advancing, guys. If we could, do I have the right one? Hello? There it is. Known as the growth guy, we'll move, uh, it's not advancing. Hello, there we go. Uh, there's the company I've got, by the way, called Gazelles. We're in about uh, a couple thousand locations, uh, helping customers all over the world scale up their businesses. Uh, there's the couple of books that uh, Shankar had mentioned right away. And so let me jump right into it. There's what we're trying to do. You know, guys get started like Nathan, and it ends up very quickly feeling like that, like you're the one kind of dragging this venture through the sand. And the goal's been, how do we make it turn into that? So it really feels like wind to your back, and you've hit that, that hockey stick. And so we developed some tools. And I think what's interesting is this thing takes a while to happen. You know, it's interesting. They're calling it four years from now, but it took the Internet 40 years to become valuable. It took electricity 40 years to become valuable. Big Data was launched in 1973, actually by Christopher's father at McKinsey. And only in 2013, 40 years later, did it finally hit the, the modern press. And so this is a, a long-term journey, as you can see, and we know that Nathan will, will experience himself. I just looked at Apple just for fun. Started in 76, by 2001, their 25th anniversary. I, you know, 9,600 employees is good, but, you know, it's not hardly putting a dent in the universe. And it was their 25th anniversary where they launched the iPod, and the rest is history. I looked the same thing with Starbucks. And Starbucks had the same kind of past. Started in 1971, by their 25th anniversary, Howard Schultz said, you know what, I think we're finally ready to get outside the U.S. and all the rest of the growth has happened since. And so this is quite, quite a journey moving forward that only a few companies have been able to do it in something shorter than that. But whether it's new technologies or it's new entrepreneurs, you've got to hang in there and have the patience, I think, to move forward. Uh, and so I've got a new book coming out called Scaling Up. It's going to replace the latest book because here's what we're looking at. Look, there's a lot of interest in startups. But the real needles are moved by the scale-ups, and then hopefully, if you don't uh, screw it up, then you can actually end up buying it back, which is what Michael Dell has done recently and taken his company uh, private. And what our goal is, is to try to keep companies from stalling out. And so we built some tools to help folks do that. So holler if we can. But what I want to do is focus on two things. What I think are some trends that we need to be looking at, kind of the idea of this event. And then I'm going to share with you what I think are the greatest business decisions that have been made that we as mere mortals can actually apply to our companies. And I saw many of those represented by Nathan's presentation. So let's take a look at, first of all, and this was in my Fortune column. I'm the venture columnist for Fortune magazine as well. What I consider the four big trends that we need to be looking at. And I think first and foremost is this. I think it's one of the most important KPIs for not only our countries, but our companies, and that's robots per capita. By the way, you can see, I think this bodes well for Japan moving forward. Singapore, South Korea, and Germany are doing extremely well. Spain is uh, equal to about the United States right now. One of our clients is the 100-ton gorilla in the microphone space. When Barbara Streisand went on tour, she made sure that they got a custom microphone made by the Sydney-based company called Rhodes Microphone. And what's interesting is they were manufacturing in China. That has now all been brought back to Sydney. They've got a couple hundred employees, but nobody is making the product. They basically have a dark factory that is producing these. And so we think one of the most important things we're all going to have to look at, again, as companies and countries, is what are we doing in order to get robotics involved in whatever it is that we're doing moving forward. By the way, what's interesting, just came out from Oxford a few months ago, a study that said looking at the 702 jobs in this next generation will be replaced 47% by robots, which I don't think is 
going to bode well for the unemployment numbers that all of us countries and companies are looking at. So first is robotics. Second is I named what's called newsjacking. There's actually a book by David Meerman Scott called Newsjacking, and I think it's the most important thing you've got to do. That's exactly what Nathan did. There was some hot news around the election. He, he newsjacked that and, made, and was able to insert his company into the middle of the mainstream newscast. We saw this just recently. Um, Elon Musk announced what was going to be, he thinks, his fifth in industry that he's going to disrupt. He's really upset about this $75 billion train boondoggle between San Francisco and LA. And so he came into the news and he explained this thing he called the Hyperloop. Well, this little unknown company called White Cloud decides within 24 hours because they're experts in the AI area of 3D design and printing that they're going to actually print up a real model of what Elon Musk dream was, and these guys garnered more global news for their small startup than any other activity that they could have prescribed to. And so, figure out what is the hot news today and every day, which is why you need a, a strong functioning marketing person on your team, figuring out a way that you can newsjack that and become the second paragraph. Third, I gave to Vijan Govindran, who came up with a book called Reverse Engineering, Reverse Innovation. And here's what's critical. The real breakthroughs aren't going to be happening in the first world. Uh, you heard Nathan get to New York. Well, I think what you've got to do is get to Africa. And a lot of the large companies are figuring out that the only way that we're really going to innovate ideas that will be useful for everyone else is to figure out how to make it affordable and useful in places where they don't have a lot of money. And so GE put together a device for $1,000 that replaces a $10,000 ECG machine. And now that they've proven it useful in India, they are bringing those back to the first world. Imagine if the number one killer of men in the United States is heart attacks, number two is women. We're going to have one of these devices probably in every one of our homes. And so what you need to be doing is not hanging out so much here in the modern spaces, but you need to figure out if we can make our product work in these much more challenging areas of the planet, then we've got the breakthroughs that we can bring to the first world. By the way, a lot of the big companies are figuring this out. You need to as well. And then last, obviously, this whole trend that I mentioned as I opened up around big data. And the number one news story for us at Fortune Magazine in 2013 was the massive turnaround of Reed Hastings at Netflix. I mean, this was a company that just prior to this was considered dead. They were like the laughing stock of the industry. Hey, Connor. Um, and so what they did is they mined their massive big data. They know exactly what movies, who rants at what time, how far into the movie do you go before you stopped. And in that analysis, they said, if we could actually find a series that was about the the universal issue on the planet right now, which is the corruption of government, and we've seen that every place, not just Spain, not just U.S., not just Syria, but about the corruption of government, and it happened to star Kevin Spacey, we would have a hit on our hands, and they knew it before they did the deal. Well, the rest is history. That turned that company around. They're continuing to do uh, innovative new uh, content for themselves. And just the latest news yesterday, how this, how this show has become a huge hit across places like India and others. And so it's the power of us harnessing big data as small companies that I think is going to be critical for us moving forward. So there's four trends that we think all of us need to embrace if you're going to be able to scale up your business moving forward. Now, what I want to do on this last bit of time that I've got is talk about this latest book that I wrote with my fellow editors at Fortune Magazine, where I looked at what I considered the 18 greatest business decisions of all time. By the way, the impetus for this was the, the, the night I was in India at the top of a you know, hotel in New Delhi with my partner, sipping probably the most expensive Jack Daniels I have ever sipped in my life. And that day, they announced Steve Jobs' death. And it was quite a traumatic 
moment for me. Steve, I considered one of the original young entrepreneurs when I launched the Young Entrepreneurs Organization. I threw the party for Steve uh, post his uh, being fired from Apple in 1985, his first kind of coming out. And I had about 1,186 of you, including Michael Dell was sitting there. I put him at the head table with Steve and many, many of the other, Mark Cuban, who went on to do broadcast.com, and many of the, the young entrepreneurs that became kind of our role models moving forward. And so it was, a, it was an unbelievably emotional evening when I got the news being in India. And I said, what an amazing decision that, that Apple made to bring Steve back and, and then do the greatest work of his life. And maybe there's some other decisions. And so we wrote him down that evening. We wrote him up and said, maybe there's some lessons for the rest of us as we begin to scale up our ventures. And so let's take a look at these. So I'm going to call this last piece uh, the power of decision. And clearly it's this. Your success equals all the decisions that Nathan and his, his founders made every moment of the day that have led them to this point where we're seeing their success in 2013 and beyond. And so wrote this book. And let's, so let's take a look at them. And to me, it's all based around this very simple idea that, look, your job's not to have the answers. I want you to be clear about that. Your job is to have the right question. And then to tap into as big a part of the world as you can in order then to get the answers. And that's really what Nathan and their team did when, when they were advised to get yourself to New York and talk to some of your users. And so find out what the challenges are. And so I want to start with the one idea that if you get nothing else from my presentation, it's this one. And I was kind enough to have Jim Collins, a dear friend of mine, wrote Good to Great, Built to Last, and all of those successful books, do the forward to the greatest business decisions. And in this forward, he puts forward one idea that I know has helped my company grow globally, as well as our, our thousands of clients. And it's simply this. Whenever you have a challenge, whenever you are facing an opportunity, and you catch your team sitting around discussing, man, what do we have to do, and how do we have to do it, and where do we have to go, I want you to stop. Your, your first question should always be a who question. And if you can find the right who's, that's what Nathan really did in their team, is they went and found the right who's, the Y Combinator bunch, to be the folks who could really help power their business model for it. We made a dis decision back in 2007, seeing the writing on the wall, that we wanted 50% of our revenue to be outside the United States. It's one of the things that precipitated my move to Barcelona, uh, which I've been here now for five years. This is absolutely the right city in the right time zone to do global business. It put me six time zones closer to the wild, wild east. India, I'll be in the Middle East tomorrow, in Bahrain, in China. And so my team is sitting around saying, you know, what do we have to do and how do we have to do it and where do we have to go? And we're like, wait a second. Let's, take our, let's eat our own dog food. All we have to do is find the right who. And all the what's and the how's and the where's will take care of themselves. And so it took me 24 months, but I got uh, probably the guru on the planet. Uh, he's a German writer, Herman Simon, who understands what it takes for privately held companies to go global. Uh, he knew more about it as pinky than I do in my entire being. And we got him on our advisory board, and the rest is history. With his advice, five years later, we are at 47% of our revenue outside the United States. So what is the challenge that you're facing right now or the opportunity? And your only job after this event is to get out a piece of paper and try to figure out who's the smartest human being we can find on the planet to advise us to move into that particular space. Now, Keith Ferrazzi, who I'm a huge fan of, I think he's the Mr. Relationship Guru, has a very simple idea along this line. And that is, take out a piece of paper, and we do this with CEOs, and say, what are the top 50 to 250 relationships you're going to need to double the size of your company next? If you look at my particular 50, I've got 22 of our 2,000 plus customers that are influencers in their particular industries, catapult systems being that in the IT services field. And I want to make sure that I stay close to those 22 of our 2,000 customers. It's my editor at Fortune Magazine. It is my board of advisors like Herman Simon and John Kone and Jack Stack that have helped us do the things that we're doing around the globe. It's my six CEOs 
CEOs running our different companies, and it's my head of operations, Joanne, so it can be folks that are internal. And they're people I've yet needing relationships with if I'm going to now double the size of our company again in the next three to five years. And so get the piece of paper out, make the list, and then take, take Keith's advice next, which is never eat alone. Uh, that is your most viable tool in order to grow your business, which is breakfast and lunches. And I can tell you, the fundamental shift in my thinking occurred when I moved from Washington, D.C., which is where my company is based, to Barcelona. Back then, I would work hard all through lunch and breakfast and dinner, cranking on the business, because I was too busy to go out and have a meal with someone to break bread. You come to Barcelona, is Connor, you know, that is impossible. You know, things are shut down. You're going to spend two to three hours at a fantastic lunch with Vino. And I can tell you, in the 48 months I've been here, I've got deeper, closer relationships politically, in the business community, in the academic world, and obviously in the entrepreneurial world than I ever did in the 40 years prior to that in the United States. And so pick your list and then go have two or three breakfasts or lunch every single week, very much like the Airbnb model where you're going to kind of hang out with folks, and those are the relationships that you will nurture for a lifetime. Now, let's dig into these final five decisions, and then we'll get on. I think I can get us back on time here. So I gave the number five greatest business decision, literally to Jack Welch, a GE, who made a very important bet, let 100,000 people go in his kind of depths of GE's time, Yet he invested $50 million in Crotonville to educate folks. Now, what does that apply to us? Well, I think it's not by accident that the final decision Steve Jobs made, his final project in the two years he knew he'd be on this planet, was to launch Apple University. Um, I think who's done a great job in this space, he's my favorite blogger, I, I read everything that he writes, is Ben Horowitz. And Andreessen Horowitz is the, I think, most important non-VC VC in the world. By the way, he's got a new book coming out. I encourage you to grab it and read the wisdom of Ben. But the thing Ben understands, and one of the reasons why they win deals over all the other competitors in Silicon Valley, is he believes in the entrepreneur. And he believes in investing in their education and making them into great leaders versus replacing them wholeheartedly, which has typically been the approach of most VCs in the marketplace out there. This is a guy who understands that like what you're doing here, taking a few minutes, precious minutes out of your time of growing your business to get some ideas is one of the most important things that you can do. And so continue to make that investment. The number four decision I gave to a very unlikely company, one of only two outside the United States, we thought had made the greatest business decisions of all time, and it was this little Korean company that's now the seventh largest in the world and literally giving Apple a run for its money. Now, how did this happen and what can we learn from it? Well, Chairman Lee made a decision in 1990 to get outside the country and most importantly to learn a whole bunch of other languages. And they took 400 young people. I said, look, you're going to learn every language on the planet. We're going to stick you out in that corner of the globe. And you've got a year to just basically build a network, to perfect the language, to understand the culture, and then come back and share what it is that you learn. One of my favorite stories, they send a young South Korean to Russia, Soviet Union at the time. And he's hanging out there for a year, and he comes back, and he, he has to submit a, uh, what became an 80-page report on what he learned. There, there wasn't a word about business. It was basically 80 pages about the drinking habits of Russians. And if anyone's been there, you understand the importance of that. Well, you know the rest of that story. Two years later, he comes back, and he is now the head of Samsung in that entire part of the re world, and every product they've introduced has gone to number one. Now, what does that mean for us? I am competing with a dear friend of mine right now, uh, and uh, there's, there's Samsung's moves, and that is Tomas. I've only had one private client in Barcelona, and that has been Softonic. I met Tomas and Emilio when they were only about $5 million in revenue. They're considerably much bigger than that here today. 
Uh, and one of the most important decisions they made was to get out of Spain. They, they were at first just a service for Spanish-speaking people in order to download free, safe software. And they were competing with the 100-ton gorilla, Download.com, in the United States. And where they won, and won big, is they were the first to get into multiple languages so that they could then be available to everyone else on the planet besides download.com. Great news, as of today, they're number one in the world, and they beat the 100-ton gorilla in the United States. And so our lesson here is you got to get out of town. And to me, the only way to really protect your business is to diversify geographically not in terms of different products and different services. I would rather you stay laser focused and then march around the planet as your strategy for growing the business. Number three I gave to what is the largest revenue company in the world and that is Walmart. Almost a half a trillion in revenue. Now, what could we possibly learn from this behemoth for our companies. And, and Nathan couldn't have described it any better as he was describing for you the ramp up of Airbnb. Here is what we can learn. And, and the success of Walmart, and we sent actually my editor in, Hank Gilman, one of only three that's ever been allowed in the inner circle at Walmart, Jack Welch at GEB and the other, and an unnamed CEO out of Japan who we could guess probably what company he was with. Hank goes in there to say, could we possibly, hey Matthew, could we possibly figure out what is the key to Walmart's success? And Hank came out of that and said, I think I figured it out. It was a habit, a routine that Sam started in his very first store in that very first Saturday morning there in Bentonville, Arkansas. And what he did, and you got to imagine how progressive this was 44 years ago, he sat down before the store opened up and he said, you know what, employees, what did you learn this week? What did you hear from customers? What are customers saying we ought to do and make changes? Sam himself would spend his week talking to employees, talking to customers, and shopping competitors. And every Saturday morning, they would decide what's one or two things they could do to tweak in this case, their product, their service, their store. What's one or two things we could do every week? And if you can make your company 1% better every week, compound interest is your friend. Let's speed forward 44 years later. 200 leaders at Walmart leave Sunday night or Monday morning, and they spend 80% of their week out just doing one thing, talking to employees, talking to customers, and shopping competitors. They come back Thursday night, and they have a meeting in a room about like this where 200 of them begin to try to figure out what did we learn so that we can tweak our model slightly week after week. Two lessons. What was the first piece of great advice that Nathan and the team got? Was to get where your best customers are and go hang out with them. Where are they? They're in New York. Well, let's get to New York and let's go spend time talking to them and figuring out what it is that they want. And then they started tweaking it 1% of the time. A better picture here, a better description there, a better pricing there. That is absolutely the process. It's the whole essence of Eric Reese's lean startup where you get in very close contact directly with your customers as Alberto is doing here sponsoring your contest uh, where you're giving away folks who can rapidly prototype some piece of software so they can get things tested as quickly as Airbnb. Alberto's gotten here with his customers to figure that out. The second lesson, and somebody said this, you know, we, we're famous for this thing called the one-page strategic plan. And you can, you can write whatever you want on this business plan, this dream, but let me tell you, your real strategy is not what you write on that plan, it's what you put in your calendar every week. You just show me your calendar and I'll tell you your strategy. And I guarantee you, anyone who's a leader of a company in this room, if you're not spending, and I'm being literal here, I'm being very precise, 80% of your week, if it isn't figuratively or literally out of the office, 
out talking to customers, talking to employees, talking to you know, shopping competitors, if you're not literally spending 80% of your week doing that, you're going to fall behind the competitor who does. And so again, it did not surprise me that the real breakthrough in Nathan's business that you just heard was when he finally got out of their apartment and got to New York and spent time out in the marketplace with real customers, making real improvements on a 1% basis at a time. And once you do that and perfect the model, then, as they were advised, you can scale. By the way, GE calls it quick market intelligence, so even the largest companies in the world make sure that their salespeople are calling in every day, reporting on what it is they're hearing in the marketplace. As someone else said, while you're looking at your calendar, your competitor's looking at their watch. And so you have to have the intel slightly faster than the competition and then act on it quicker. The number two decision, I would come back to how I started my, my presentation. And that was Apple deciding to bring Steve Jobs back as the iCEO and doing literally the greatest work of his life. Now, what is it that we mere mortals can learn from Steve Jobs' journey? And here's what's interesting. It's clear Steve needed to be fired from Apple. He had not learned what was necessary to build a great company. And he admitted later on that it was in his wilderness years, when he was actually out building Pixar, that he learned the single most important idea, single most important business management idea that allowed him then to take Apple huge and become the largest market cap company on the planet. And it was very simply this. At Pixar, he saw the power of having everybody's every waking moment and every ounce of resources focused, not on 10 things, not on five things, but one thing, and that was Toy Story. And he knew if we could invest two years in that kind of effort, we could create something great. Again, it was Nathan's decision that, you know what? We actually are going to have to get some discipline. We're actually all going to have to wake up at 8 o'clock, and we're going to have to crank hard all day, day after day after day, focused on one thing, and then we can create brilliance. Something that you're going to do kind of as a side is never going to work. So Steve comes back to Apple. He draws the famous two-by-two two matrix. And it was a good friend of mine right here in Barcelona, Fergal, who had to close down all the printing operations for Apple. Because Steve called up and said, Fergal, shut them down. All we're going to do, we're going to get out of handhelds and printers and scanners and all that other stuff we're doing. And all we're going to do is build two desktops and two laptops. Now, that sounds like four toy stories. But then what he did is he divided the company literally into four separate teams, walled off physically from each other, so that everyone in the company had absolutely one focus. And two years later, the rest is history. They produced some of the greatest two desktops and laptops the world had seen. Company went from broke to five billion in market cap, and then Steve had the discipline to stick with it. What was their next toy story two years later? The iPod. What was their next toy story? The iPhone. What was their next toy story two years later? The iPad. And by the way, his last toy story was Apple University, which he hoped would be the way that his legacy would continue. So what's your toy story? It's exciting that Mark Zuckerberg's in town. But in December of 2011, Mark wakes up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, as we reported in Fortune magazine, just a few months prior to his pending IPO, and realized that he had just missed the biggest trend on the planet, even though he was the youngest self-made billionaire at this point, and that is he had missed mobile. And so January, just two weeks later, he puts up a physical 
white tent on the campus of Facebook, and it is a mandatory meeting of all 10,000 Facebook employees. 2,000 are local, 8,000 around the world that are forced to beam in. And he, everyone's thinking it's Mark going to announce the pending IPO that was then May of 2012. But Mark just kind of mentioned it in passing. It's like, look, guys, this is just a necessary step we need to take. I'll take care of that distraction. What we must do is go mobile. And one of the things that we teach leaders is that you must get on message. And you must take that message and repeat yourself so much that everybody in the company wants to just puke if they hear you say it again. And for the next 18 months, at every quarterly meeting, every weekly meeting, every acquisition, every single decision, every single hire that they made, every single prioritization was built around one thing. Mark Zuckerberg relentlessly saying mobile, 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 mobile. That was his toy story. And 18 months to the month, in May of last year, they released their version of going mobile and the rest is history. Here's a company taking huge hits because the opening price was 38 bucks stock, plummeted to 27. Everyone's thinking, you know, what the hell happened there? Mark didn't care. He had his focus. Well, you saw the latest results. Over 50% of their revenue last quarter was off of mobile. The stock price is considerably almost double the $38 offering price, and the rest is history. Everybody thinks this stuff is easy. No. It's about a leader getting crystal clear what is their toy story, and then getting everyone in the organization laser-focused, engaged with the market, making 1% improvements every week, and only having one thing to accomplish, that you get Airbnb or you get Facebook. This stuff does not happen by accident. And if Mark had not made that decision, I don't think we'd be touting them as much at this Mobile World Congress as if he had. So what is your toy story? Now, what's the second lesson we can learn from Steve? And what's interesting is that the height, when, when Apple achieved its highest market cap just two months prior to Steve's untimely death, if you total up the entire market share of all their products globally, it was only 7%. Ikea only has 5% of the global furniture market. Your second job is to figure out the right 7%. You do not want the other 93. And by the way, this 7% represented 50% of the profitability of the entire industry. That's where you want to go. Now, I was in India recently, and they said, but Verm, isn't all the activity at the bottom of the pyramid? Yes. But of that billion people in India, when Tata Motors, who I featured in my book, went after them with the nano car, if they had just gotten to the right 70 million of the billion, they'd be much more successful today. Your second job as the entrepreneur is to figure out what is the right 7%. Again, I love the single most important piece of advice Nathan's team received, which is, where are, who's your customer? And what was his answer? Everyone. He comes back and, no, let's ask the question again. Where are all your customers you have today? New York City. Then get your butt to New York and hang with them. And so your job is to figure out the right 7% and go after them with a vengeance. And by the way, that's been a big enough market share for almost any company who wants to dominate their industry on the planet. Now, I'm going to skip this real quick. Two last ideas. I featured this interesting company in the book. A lot of you recognize soft soap. It's almost a foregone conclusion. Nobody uses bar soap anymore. But this was quite an innovation of these young entrepreneurs. And what's everybody's concern as an entrepreneur? You come up with the next soft soap. You come up with the next iPod. And then what happens? The big companies come in and crush you. They just take it from you. 
And that, that's a real thing you've got to worry about. And so the soft soap guy said, look, we're going to invest a lot. We're going to make this thing a big deal. And then all of a sudden, Procter & Gamble is going to come in and they're going to crush us. And so, I kind of skipped the slide here, but, oh, it's not going backwards. Help me, guys. Can you guys go backwards for me? Back there? All right. See, I love this book. If, if there's like one book besides Ben Horowitz that you read, it's this old classic. He died the same year as Steve Jobs did, Eli Goldratt's book called The Goal. And it was all about understanding how to control the constraint, the choke point. Every industry has a choke point. By the way, the iPod would not be successful if they had not really controlled the choke point of the distribution of music iTunes. You guys got to know the inside story is Steve Jobs fought the app store almost to his death. It was totally against his, his core value of letting anyone else touch his devices and make software that would run on it. And in one of these famous FU, no FU, no FU stories that we undug, finally Steve relented and let the guy launch the app store. And I can tell you, the iPhone and the iPad would not have the stickiness today if the 10 billionth app had not been downloaded in 2013. So your other job as the entrepreneur is to find the choke point and control it. John D. Rockefeller, there were these barrels that, that held the oil when he was trying to gain control of that industry. And to hold those oak um, pieces together was this iron ring. And only one company made that iron ring. And so John D. Rockefeller bought that company. When he controlled the iron ring, he controlled the distribution of oil. And so what did the soft soap guys do? Well, there's this little spring pump, which, by the way, was not ubiquitous back when they launched. It was you know, a very specialty product. They made the most important bet in their early company's history, and that was to buy up entire global year supply of those pumps. And so when they launched their product out in the marketplace and they all were heating up and everyone's saying, man, you guys have got something here. The Procter & Gamble's of the world said, all right, guys, let's copy them. They couldn't get any pumps. And it gave Soft Soap the 18-month runway they needed to build up critical mass and market recognition to be a player in the marketplace. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I know this case study was out there and well known at the moment that Apple launched the iPod. And look, at 9,600 employees, it would have been pretty easy for a bunch of other companies, including Sony, on the planet to jump in and copy that. Yet, one of the single most important decisions they made was to lock up the entire global supply of that proprietary disk that was at the center and heart of the iPod. Having not made that decision, again, I don't think we'd be seeing the Apple that we're seeing today. So what is the control point, the choke point, and can you get control? Last decision I gave to what I think was the greatest decision ever made on the planet. It led to the wealthiest country on the planet at the time, the United States. And that was when Henry Ford decided back in the early 1900s to double the wages of his people from $2.50 to $5. Now, why do I, what, what possibly can we as mere mortals learn from this? I don't know about you, but probably one of your largest expenses is payroll. And to me, one of the single most important decisions you will make in this next 40 to four to 40 years is how are you going to leverage people in your particular business model. And so I want to end with a final story, and that's around Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. I want you guys to get an appreciation for what Mark did. When Mark went public, the final number was 14.8 billion is what he got. Just to put it in perspective, Twitter only got a billion eight in their recent IPO. Mark has done things in a handful of years that even his closest rivals have not been able to achieve. And he only has been the key to making WhatsApp achieve what they did because he's the one who spent the $19 billion 
this last week to get them. What is it can we can learn from Mark that every one of us can apply to our businesses? And it comes back to a very simple idea, that this is the competitive weapon of the information age. By the way, I found a picture of the male brain. It's slightly different, but we'll talk about that later. Let's go back to the human brain. And look, it comes back to this, very simply. Last century was about getting the right butts in the right seats. Who could you get on your bus? This century, it's a very simple business model. Can you build a business that gets the most people on the bus? See, think about it. Facebook's real valuation is tied to the billion three pages that have been put up. And who's done all of that work for free? You. Which means the few folks he does have working at Facebook, he can pay them a ton of money to attract the best talent because he's leveraged another billion three of us to work literally for free. Amazon. The real value of their business model is the millions of us that keep it updated with feedback and recommendations and the like that allow us then to have confidence and sort through the product offerings that we would like to, to choose. Wikipedia. 7 million volunteers, 31,000 people who spend at least two hours every day keeping that free source of information updated. That's how you leverage a business model. And so this final decision is, if you can build a business model that leverages the crowd, Airbnb, versus just your own people, you're going to beat a competitor who doesn't do this. The App Store, when Apple finally allowed the rest of the planet to do its work for it, only then was its business model and valuation unleashed. Peter Diamandis founded the X Prize and one of my favorite books, Abundance. And so this guy, Rob McCune, he, he buys a gold mine up in Canada. And obviously his first question is, where's the gold? And so you take Jim Collins' advice, and I'm going to go out and find the smartest who's I can on the planet. And he hires some of the smartest gold geologists you can, and they can't find anything. And so he said, you know what? Maybe I'll turn it over to the crowd. And he put together the global search challenge here. And here was the specific deal. I'm going to put up the four terabytes of geological data we've got for free. I want the world to see it. And any team that can find at least six million ounces or more will win a half a million dollar prize. When the dust settled, 400 teams downloaded the information, 100 teams submitted where they thought the gold was, and three teams won and split the half a million dollars. Two teams from Russia, they are wicked smart up there, and another team from New Zealand, about as far away from Canada as you can get on the globe. And to date, those teams have found several billion dollars worth of gold based on what was a half a million dollar prize. I love these guys, quirky. You've got IDEO in the old business model. We're going to get some of the smartest human beings in a room, and we're going to come up with new retail ideas for our clients. Quirky said, let's turn it over to the crowd. Anyone in the crowd have a great retail idea, we'll make sure we get it rapidly prototyped and tested in the marketplace. And a company just a few years old is already at 50 million and growing rapidly because they have built a business model different than the old guys at IDO. And then I love this one, Jones Soda. Let's let the crowd design our labels. So not only do they take us, have a sense of ownership of our product, but they then viral it out, we get our labels made for free. And so look, in finding gold, in coming up with retail ideas, or designing my labels on my soda product, like Facebook, like Airbnb, like Amazon, the companies that are going to win big in the next four and 40 years are those that figure out how to tap into the crowd. In summary, get educated, get out there and learn every language you can, get in every part of the globe that you can with your business, 
Make sure that you're mining what you're learning from customers and employees and the competitors every day of every week. And then your focus is to make a 1% improvement. And you're going to make that 1% improvement to your next toy story. And that toy story is going to be aimed at only 7% of the market because that's all you need in order to build the largest market cap company on the planet. And along the way, if you can leverage the crowd more than the competition, you win big. Guys, good luck and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.